metrics and flexible machine tricks, the theory of growth and inflation, also known as the Mundell Tobin effect. Which relates relating which relates monetary expansion, the real rate of interest and economic growth, and was a pioneer in the development of supply side economics, and as I mentioned earlier, played a key role, early role in the founding of the euro. Six volumes of his collected works were published in Chinese in 2004. Professor Mundell is an honorary president of the Mundell International University located in Beijing, China, and is the recipient of several honorary degrees in different countries as well as more than 40 uh, honorary professorships around China. He is the chairman of the Santa Colomba Group in Siena, Italy on world currency. In 1999, Professor Mundell received the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of monetary and fiscal policy under different exchange rate regimes and his analysis of optimum currency areas. In 2001, he was appointed Companion of the Order of Canada. In 2005, he received the Global Economics Award of the Kiel Institute in Germany and was also appointed Grand Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Order of Merit, Duke of Parma. He lives today between New York City and Tuscany, Italy, but those of us who know him well realize we are much more likely to meet him in Bangkok, in Beijing, in Tokyo, in Dubai, and many other capitals around the world. He is truly a global citizen, and we are all very lucky to have him here with us today to share his ideas with us. Great pleasure to introduce Professor Robert A. Mundell. Officials, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to see uh, such a welcoming audience. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk on this subject, putting globalization into the National Economic Development Strategy. Uh, I guess that's coming up. Uh, the, uh, I'll just talk on these uh, mega trends, globalization, economic model and uh, the sufficiency economy, a little bit redundant after the introduction we've heard, uh, sufficiency policies and the harmony in international uh, arrangements and then currency and world money. Uh, world economy today uh, is in a remarkable period. Uh, this year is, I think, unprecedented in that uh, for the first time, all the major economies in the world are giving them more scope for the rapidly expanding. This is a great period. It's never happened before. And uh, of course, it's, it's uh, marked by some incidents and some pessimism and other things. In the last quarter, we, it doesn't mean that it's because the past has been good, the future is going to be as good, but uh, it's uh, nevertheless something to note that never before has the world economy been in such uh, a great position? And I say here, uh, what are the drivers? What's the reason for this? Well, this is a picture of the world economy as I see it. These globes, uh, spheres, represent the big and little powers of the world. The, the uh, area of those circles represents more or less GDP of countries. Monetary power, if you like, or GDP. And uh, the GDP of the United States, the center area, here is uh, $14 trillion. The GDP of the euro area is uh, about $12 trillion at the current exchange rate. And the yen area is about uh, 4 and a half to $5 trillion. And the uh, RMB area is the is taken over the position here of number four in the world at... Uh, at uh, uh, $3 trillion. Uh, 
uh, a big set. Then in terms of currency areas, you should also count the uh, pound sterling, which is independent of the, uh, of the euro area. But we'll uh, have play with those a little later. Um, um, the key trends that we need to keep in mind Suddenly it was over 100 million people, the most productive economy in the world, and by the time World War I it was bigger than the next three biggest economies put together, Britain, Germany, and France put together. So when the Federal Reserve was created, it created a central bank for the biggest economy by far in the world and the future super economy, and that creation of that central bank and that currency gave the United States the power to change, alter the uh, uh, condition of the international monetary system for the 20th century. The condition to, to maintain, develop, or break down or eliminate the gold standard. And in fact, what turned out a long run, it turned the gold standard became a dollar standard, and they were still in that now. But then the creation of the euro in 1999 raises up something else that makes our system look a little more like a bipolar system. The four, four challenges. Well, I, I did mention the rise of China. I should mention that, but I spend so much time in China, I sometimes forget to mention it. But this is the a very big event. Uh, People have become accustomed to talking about the, um, of course, the, the uh, U.S. economy and the European economy and the Japanese economy, and then they talk about the BRIC economies, the B-R-I-C economies, an uh, acronym for um, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But I think that's now obsolete because, in fact, China is in a different category than the other economies. China is an economy now of three uh, trillion dollar economy. 
and the other economies would be India, say, one and a half trillion, and the other economies are less than that. So, uh, so the uh, uh, it's the big four economies now include China, and then the next group is what I would call the br BRIM economies: B R I M, Brazil, Russia, India, and Mexico, which is uh, the fourth. Thing adding Mexico to this. Now, the challenge is then for the world economy adjusting to globalization. And every country has to do this in its own way. Absorbing and spreading the IT revolution, fitting China into the world economy, and stabilizing currency areas. We can't avoid that. We talk now about the low dollar and the high oil prices in dollar terms and high gold prices. This is an important uh, factor here. Key factors that have been making growth as rapid as it has been over the recent years is the U.S. economy has been the motor for the um, last 20 years, except for two big recessions in 2001 and 1991. The U.S. economy has been going forward rapidly, uh, and it's a the very efficient economy. The second factor is what can be looked upon as a negative or a positive, but it's the U.S. deficits. Because while they, the U.S. deficits are, uh, uh, maybe from Americans' standpoint, they're not so good, uh, from the global standpoint, they provide the surpluses for all those other countries. And that is the fuel that gives them the liquidity and has pushed up the, uh, the role for economic expansion. The uh, last year, at the uh, Singapore meetings of the International Monetary Fund, one of the big subjects of discussion was the fact that the International Monetary Fund is in financial straits. It wasn't, it's making losses. It doesn't have enough income because nobody was borrowing from it. Nobody needed to borrow. So the world was healthy and so uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, IMF was in trouble. Like uh, uh, when people are healthy, the hospitals go broke. So we shouldn't look upon that as too bad a thing. But we have to worry about the question whether the, the deficits of the United States, uh, if they could last and not do too much harm and people didn't get jealous of the fact that it let the United States uh, spend an extra 5 or 6 percent of its GDP, more than it's producing, then this could go on and would keep the, road, the growth going on forever. Um, IT revolution, I've already mentioned that. The rise of China, the advent of the euro, uh, has now added a great deal of, I think, stability to the system because uh, uh, and having an alternative to the dollar is better than no alternative to the dollar. And uh, political stability, yes, of course, there are wars in uh, certain types, but by and large, this whole period has been a period of uh, high political stability and, uh, and globalization. Now, looking at globalization, which is part of the subject matter of in my title, globalization is integration at the global level. It's been going on since 1945. That is a kind of post-war, World War II, almost hegemony in part of the world of the United States, what was called sometimes the West, but in a world that did not include uh, the Soviet bloc in China. And then the globalization began uh, after China in 1978 or 1980 joined the world economy. And, uh, uh, and then uh, after the Cold War ended, when the Soviet Union and the Comic Con bloc joined the world economy. So uh, for, uh, to a very large extent, the whole world was together and globalization could continue. It's almost associated with the Pax Americana of the single superpower. Uh, we used to, historians use the term the Pax Britannica of the late 19th century, the period when um, Britain uh, wasn't, was a kind of superpower with the British Empire. Maybe not in the same sense the United States is a superpower, but it was certainly the most prestigious and most advanced power. And uh, people talked about gunboat diplomacy and things like that, and British battleships keeping a kind of Pax Britannica. Now, now we have a Pax Americana. I think if you, uh, you might not like that term, you might uh, resent it in some ways, but if you imagined what would happen 
to the world if the United States were, by some magic, 